want to introduce our our uh, speaker today. Karina Karina Grimmer is a, an textile archaeologist at the Natural History Museum in Vienna, whom I met. I I think I might have actually first met you at, at, at the uh, Textile Society of America conference at UCLA, oh. but mostly at uh, the Center for Textile Archaeology in uh, Copenhagen. And she is uh, not only a great and well-known textile archaeologist, but a super fun person. So I had to, <laughs> I had to get her to come and uh, uh, be our our speaker today. She has written a great book, The Art of Prehistoric Textile Making, which I actually have the giant version of. But uh, there is an online free and authorized PDF that you can download. And if you go to the um, place on our website uh, for this event, you can see the, the URL. Um, I, and she is a particular expert on the Hallstatt uh, textiles. And, and she is a great band, uh, uh, band weaver, tablet weaver and reconstructor, and I will just turn it over to her. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. Yeah, I'm, I will greet you from Vienna in Austria, in Europe, good old Europe. Today, as a, for me, it's evening now, and um, for you, good morning. <laughs> um, I'm archaeologist and I am very honored that I'm allowed to speak to you. I hope that you can understand me correctly. Yeah, today I will present you a lot of material from archaeological sites in Europe uh, that you might not be familiar in, uh, with, but uh, I think it's uh, nevertheless it will be quite interesting. And I will talk about what sources do we have? What do we know about textiles, textile production uh, thousands of years ago and how everything evolved? And I will also present how we, um, for, from archeological finds, how do we analyze them and how do we work with it? And of course, I'm always doing reconstructions and I, I will also show that. I hope it will be interesting for you. So, Generally, textiles, oops, uh, just a minute. Wo share ich? Okay, I just have to share. Perfect. With Peter, is it good to Yeah, okay, do you see everything? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, Generally, textiles really survive in the remote periods. I'm, I really talk about thousands of years ago. And especially if you are talking about the climatic conditions in Central and Northern Europe. Because in our climatic conditions here in Europe, we have the problem that usually everything decays within 20 or 30 years if it is buried in the ground. There are just a few conditions where things can survive. One of this is the ice. For example, here we have an ice mummy. It is about 5,300 years old. It's an ice man and he was found frozen in the glaciers of the Austrian Italian Alps. And his garments made of plant fibers and skins are excellently preserved. And in this case, from Ötzi, it was the first time that we found a complete dress ensemble from a time 5,300 years ago. In Austria, we have the salt mines in Hallstatt and in Dürnberg, and there we also have some wonderfully preserved textiles. And they are about 3,000 years old, and this is the main stuff I will talk about. In Europe, there are also some waterlogged conditions, for example, in bogs and in lakeside settlements on shores. And they survive those textiles. They are about, uh, you see the date, it's about 350 BC. And they survived because of the anaerobic acidic conditions. 
But in this problem, um, in the box, we have the problem that only things made of wool survive and not the plant material because this uh, will decay. And the normal material we have in Central Europe is mineralized textiles on metal artifacts, for example, from burials. This is quite often, but the problem is they are very small, they look really ugly and they lost their color. And so we cannot say so many things about it, but we see what these types there are and uh, what qualities there are and sometimes also the fibers. What is also very important for textile research in general are pictorial um, sources. For Central Europe, we have um, there are not so many of them. Sometimes we have small figurines uh, for Italy, for example, for the Etruscans, we also have the great paintings. And for Central Europe, we have this situle art. We see there are also some depicted people. This is about 500 BC. Uh, but if we compare our evidence with, for example, Egypt, or yeah, India even, ancient India, or Mesopotamia, Persia, it's really very, very poor. But this is what I have to live with. <laughs> and what we really have very often for our research is all of the textile tools. I've seen uh, Joe Duke, Ontario, you showed that you're working with a warp weighted loom, and we have really a lot of loom weights. This is what we really find uh, very often and we find also spindle walls and also textile tools that are made of bone and of pottery. So now it's the uh, problem how do we carry out textile research with the data that we have and the usual things is that we are studying of course the textile tools, uh, what types are they, where have they been found, for example, are they from graves or from settlements, um, for example, loom weights, sometimes we really find them lying around like um, as if the, um, as if the, 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 the loom has broken down and, uh, um, the, um, and it was burned. Um, yes. But what I'm really usually dealing with is the textiles themselves. And for the textile analysis, we have a lot of methods um, where we can get some knowledge about textile qualities that are used by past societies. For example, the analysis of leaf types and quality. We have the microstratigraphy, I will show about that, and fiber analysis. Um, yes, and we really try to, to get as much information as we can have. I mean, our problem is for textile analysis, we have more or less the same analytical tools like uh, forensic scientists and criminalists, like this, you know, all of this CSI series, <laughs> American-based, but there is a very important difference. I mean, we are not as good looking as those guys, you see, but in real life, it doesn't function to put a sample somewhere in the machine, and seconds later, you have a rotating 3D <laughs> graph popping up and showing you everything about age, material, and whatever. This is really not what, how we are working. Yes. Uh, what we are doing for fiber analysis, for example, here you see the machine. We have the scanning electron microscope and some light microscopes and there you see the fibers and you can see from the specific um, um, yeah, um, um, markers like those scales or other things, what kind of fiber is it. Here for example are fibers from Hallstatt and they are about 3000 years old. What else do we do? Uh, we are also working with digital digital microscopes and with those tools and the software uh, we are able to measure distances, angles, diameters, fiber diameters for example. This is very practical field work. For example here you see me, here I'm working in Iran uh, with a salt mummy from Cherabat and he is still there fully clothed and he's 2400 years old, a person who died when a mine collapsed. Very interesting thing. 
but this is not the task of my talk today. What is the technical data do we take? I mean, in your audience, I don't have to tell what this is. I just show the graph, you know everything. Usually I have to explain a lot what is a walk, what is a weft and so on, because usually, usually uh, archeologists don't know that. But what you might not be so familiar with is the microstratigraphy. The basic principles of micro, microstratigraphy is especially if you have an object, for example, this is a knife, um, doesn't look like, but it is, and you have uh, the, the knife blade and then you have a lot of layers uh, of wood and leather and even textiles um, over and under it, and you have to understand how those layers are to understand um, what, what happened with that object and how, how it was made. In this case, it's the, um, an iron knife with a wooden handle, and it, was, it, has, it had a, a sheet made of leather, and the leather was lined with a textile inside and was wrapped with a textile outside. This is what this kind of microstratigraphy tells me. What else are we doing? We are doing dye stuff analysis, for example, of course, with specialized labs. And they enable us to understand the use of colors and color patterns to enhance the garments. And then we also do radiocarbon dating, strontium isotope analysis, and whatever. Um, I, um, the evidence of microstratigraphy together with um, the analysis how objects are placed, for example, in a grave. If you look at this grave here, in there was a textile and the contemporary pictorial sources and sometimes written sources, all of this together gives us any idea of how textiles have been used, how even garments should have looked like. And even if the textiles themselves are quite small and um, yeah, a bit disgusting. I will show you now a very specific example. For example, this here. This is Unteräching, a grave, it's a Celtic grave, and you see here, um, it, this is a skeleton in a grave, and here you see a belt buckle, okay? And on this belt buckle you see textiles. You see it? Hopefully, this is all textile, yeah. It's really ugly and disgusting, we don't have any color, but we have very important information because we can analyze the textile. We know what textile quality is. We know that this is, for example, a tabby. Here we see uh, another textile. It's a finer one than this one. And altogether, I found four different textiles on this. And the microstratigraphy shows me how the textiles are around this item. And then I can try to do some interpretations of the textiles. For example, because I know from contemporary um, depictions that such a garment consists of a knee-long tunic, below are trousers, above is a, a, a cloak, and all of this is held by a fibula. And in this case, we know that the textile directly on the buckle must be the belted garment. In this case, this would be the tunic. If you go ahead, we know that the textile under the belted garment, and that means below the belt and the person, must be more or less the trousers. It means it's this region here. And then we have the next textile, which is over the belted buckle, and this must be the cloak. That means the microstratigraphy of the finds tell me exactly on what position we can find things, because in the grave it is sort of so frozen in time, more or less. And so we can know a lot about what textile qualities and what, um, for example, weave types have been used for such garments, even if we don't have the entire garment. Yeah, based on this material evidence, 
now I want to present what we know about technology, about function, and also about aesthetics of textiles from archaeological contexts in Europe. Starting with technology. I mean, as you really know, textile craft techniques that we still largely still em employ today date back to inventions in the Stone Age and Bronze Ages. Because this kind of how to spin a yarn um, appears in Europe about 6000 BC in Europe. It comes from the Near East and there we know it about 10,000 BC, more or less. And even the basic techniques of spinning, weaving, and patterning have been developed about yeah, this time, and in Europe we have the earliest evidence for a wall braided loom, uh, about 5000 BC. Here, um, again, greetings to Joe Duke here, me weaving on a wall braided loom that is a reconstruction of a Celtic loom and is in an open air museum in Austria. Here you see. It's the same, what she explained to you. Yeah, how are our developments now? And this might be of interest for you. Because especially some, uh, here you see a list of important finds and sites in Central Europe. I have everything in my book if you want to read about this. And I also, on my diverse papers on academia, you can also have everything of that. Here you see here we have the timeline starting with 2300 BC, early Bronze Age, Middle Bronze Age, Hashtag period, Latin period, this is Celtic, so to say. And here you see the main weave types we have in Europe before the Romans came. That means tabby, basket weave, wrap bands, twill and variants, tablet weaving, then the patterning techniques, dyeing, stripes, checks, uh, this is the flying thread technique, I will come to this later, embroidery and spin pattern. And you see here, when do we have evidence for which of those techniques? Yeah, this means that in, in Stone Age, which would be below here, and in Bronze Age, um, yeah, textile um, production is more or less quite simple. Um, I mean, we see some first innovative power in the Bronze Age. That means the, the first twill variants have been developed somewhere 1600 BC, and the first dyeing experiments also have been done then. But more or less, it was really simple based on tapis and uh, variants. Yeah, you see this. Um, yeah. I don't have to explain this um, because we have different loom types to produce different kinds of textiles. Here, for example, the tab is with one shaft loom, the multi shaft loom, and the um, diamond twill. Uh, those things are originals that I show, um, and they are from Hallstatt. They are 2,700 years old, those. And I did not Photoshop it, it really has this color. Um, Bronze Age innovations for Europe is also tablet weaving. Here you see one of the first tablet weavings. You see here the date. It, it is also from Hallstatt. And also we have some first um, striped patterned fabrics here from Franzhausen. I showed this skeleton before. This is about 2200 BC. <laughs> But then something quite interesting happens. You see it here. After the first innovations in Bronze Age, in which, of course, the main textile culture is still based on simple tabbies, there is more or less a boom in the hashtag period. You see it here. In the early Iron Age, that means between 850 and 450 before Christ, we can recognize a fully developed textile art with different colors patterns, textile qualities. And we have this evidence here, girls. This is all original material, Hallstatt about 800 before Christ. And what you see here is really a, a flourishing creativity between 800 and 400 before Christ to play with the possibilities 
of twill weaving, of coloring, of tablet weaving. You see it here, yeah? In amazing qualities and decorations. And most of, most of those textile types are still in use today. And I've seen from some of your examples, even examples for that. And you see, this is here, this is pre-Celtic. This is not Celtic textile art, it's before that. Okay? Have a sip here. Hope you like it. <laughs> Later, if you go to the Celts, again, it gets simpler. I don't know why. Because usually, if you're talking about Celtic, we would expect a lot of fancy things there because even the, the, the Romans tell about a lot about um, uh, the, the embroidered and the fancy textiles from the Celts. But what we have actually from the salt mines and from the graves, and we have really thousands of textiles from this period before 450 and um, yeah, uh, the, 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 the birth of Christ, um, we have more or less simpler types than the things that I showed you before. This here is such the period, and um, the Celtic textiles are not so fancy like that. What we see with the Celts is that we have here the beginning of an early mass production. Because if you even compare the textile tools, here for example, this is Hallstatt period spindle whorls, and this is Celtic spindle whorls. The Celtic spindle whorls are made of pot shirts, you see. Pot shirts, they are just grinded round and made a hole in. They are just functional. They are not beautiful, they are just, yeah, they function. If you look at Hallstatt period spindle whorls, you see that they are really beautiful, and they show they are decorated and they show the creativity of their owners or of their producers. They show some, some, some pride in making, pride in creating things. And those spindle wheels, the tools, fit very well with this uh, very fancy um, uh, the textiles that we have from the Hallstatt period. While the Celtic ones are more yeah, efficient and yeah, more in, um, inside of uh, mass production. Yeah, you see here in this area where we have the fancy textiles, we also have the fancy textile tools. But this is also very interesting for me because as an archeologist, I'm also cultural anthropologist and sociologist. And I want to understand why we have an evidence like that. I want to understand why there is a progress in textile techniques, in textile production at all? Why did the people did not restrain themselves? Why at all did people do inventions and innovations? And I will I have uh, some glimpses on the theoretical background now. Uh, maybe the answer lies in uh, psychology and in neurosciences. Um, it's um, an American psychologist, Abraham Maslow, you might know him, and he analyzed uh, human motivation in his theory, The Hierarchy of Needs. And he points that there are some physiological basic needs of life, like food, clothing, a place to live, and safety needs, and so on. And of course, they have to be served. But there's also a next step. Here, the social components, the esteem needs, the belonging, belongingness, and then also the aesthetic needs. And those needs manifest in elaboration, balance, and form. And they can be found in all cultures and through all periods. And all innovations in mankind are correlated to these principles. And concerning textiles, I can say that, of course, they serve physiologically basic needs. Textiles have been invented to keep warm, to protect. But if it, were, it would be just that, there would be no reason for further development because all basic interventions, all basic techniques are known since Stone Age. You can spin, you can weave a more or less coarse tabby, and this can keep you warm. 
there would be no need to do more things, to invent, to be creative, if there would be not all of those other needs by people. That means inventions, innovations in textile craft are also a product of esteem needs, of cognitive and aesthetic needs, to invent complicated techniques for patterns, to do fine qualities, it's much more than a basic practicability. If you look at that, from 800 BC onwards, textiles in Central Europe get more and more decorations. But why? What happened here? How was the technological, social, and economic background of textile innovations, especially in Hallstatt period, that all of this could flourish. From ethnographic and historical studies, we know that there are specific societies which are very dynamic, where innovations are welcome and can develop. And especially in Hallstatt period, there must have been a social environment which stimulated creativity and variety and there was a very strong need for aesthetics and prestige. It must have been a very dynamic period and now we look at prestige and representation in Hallstatt period that means between 800 and 400 BC. Usually in archaeological textile research the topic prestige and representation is usually discussed um, on the jewelry and on metal uh, objects because um, textiles um, are usually not so perceived by archaeologists that they have been important and uh, usually artifacts like that are seen by archaeologists and other scientists that are important uh, to show off, so to say, to show status, to show prestige. If you look at that, what happens if a person looks at an object? The eyes scan the surface, they are looking for edges, points that affect the transition, and more time and attention is given to complex objects with highly decorated surfaces. And if we discuss this principle now for textiles in Central Europe and textile techniques, we just look at surfaces and effects. Because a surface, a textile texture, cannot only be seen but also felt. And the haptic aspect of textiles, you all know that, is a very integral part. And people, even in prehistoric times, have been able to change the haptic effect of a cloth. They could do, they could make different haptic experiences um, um, in changing the style of how they spun, how they wove, uh, what was the, um, the, the, the after effect, so to say, um, uh, fulling, for example, um, doing a very uh, thick or thin cloth a thick one that is very hard and stable, a cloth one that is very smooth. They also did some three-dimensional effects. For example, pile loop fabrics. <coughs> and of course, color. Color is really a very important thing for textiles. Most, researcher, most researchers think that textiles just serve as a background for other things. For example, for jewelry or dress fittings or belts or whatever. Maybe in Hajta period, the people thought the same. This is a reconstruction of the grave from Hallstatt and all what you see is a one-to-one -one reconstruction of an original find. And if you ever can come to Austria, please come to the Natural History Museum, you can see this there. All of those artifacts are in the museum. In this case, even if we would use a textile, and we have blue dyed textiles in Hallstatt, in the salt mine, even if this would be just the background, the color is also of importance because in this case 
the blue dyed textile serves as a perfect contrast to the attached metal ex um, um, objects. <coughs> Early sheep breeds, it's a question when color and dyeing starts in Central Europe. Early sheep breeds have brown wool, you see it here, but there's also evidence for breeding sheep with white wool, even in Bronze Age. You see here is the date, 1500 BC, and here you see on this textile two different kinds of wool. One is real white wool and the other one is brown wool. That means even in this very early time you have a variety of different wool, um, uh, natu natural hoos for wool. We know of white, different brown hoos, even gray and black. That means this is the natural variety and then something interesting happens because we see in our textiles when we um, make the chronological row that um, people tried more and more to get the pigments out of the fibers. It means to breed sheep with white wool because, of course, white wool is essential if you want to dye. You cannot dye bright yellow with on this brown wool. That's not possible. But they had some uh, success, and here you see one of the earliest blue dyed textiles that we know from Europe. Here you see Hallstatt, the date 1500 BC. Here you see the chromatography, and here you see the fibers on microscopic imaging. You really see the blue dye. Yeah. And here you see the textile itself, and you see this is a twill, and you see it was dyed after weaving. You see it here? Because there it's open, the, the dye didn't penetrate the whole textile, it's just on the surface. Dyeing and color and use of natural hues is important if you want to make patterns. And patterning of textiles is the task that was very, very common in Hallstatt period, as, as I told you before, here Hallstatt, 800 to 400 BC. Here you see some textiles, you see checkered ones, you see here a tablet woven ones, and here this is all from um, pedal band weaving types. Of course, you see here some discoloration because all of those textiles have been embedded in a salt mine for thousands of years, and so they are a bit more dull than they have been when they were sort of uh, fresh, fresh in use. But we analyzed all of those textiles and so we could see that um, they uh, were able to create charming patterns with dyes and they used, for example, welt, meta, but also chamomile and other dye stuffs to get really nice bright dyes. We also have textiles dyed with insect dyes. And they, for example, have been found in the Saltman Hallstatt, but also in, um, in graves. Yeah, what kinds of patterns? Just have a, a, a nice lookup on, on patterns in prehistory. <coughs> Stripes are the first patterns that we have. And here, we, you know, I've shown you this. This textile was found in there. Franzhausen in Austria. It's about 2000 BC, that means 4000 years old. And here we have the first striped textile in Europe, in Central Europe, I mean, north of the Alps. And stripes break up the monochrome surface of a textile, and stripes define edges and a channel the, uh, the um, viewer's attention in a specific direction. And this is really very important because if you look at the reconstruction of the textile, here you see bow, and in there this textile was found and we did a one-to-one -one reconstruction, thread by thread, so to say. What do, you, what do you see if you follow the lines of the textile? It really enhances also 
all of the other items that have been found in the grave. That means the textiles and the metal artifacts, they have an interplay together. The early striped fabrics highlight the more or less monochrome textile world of the Bronze Age, and I showed this before, but I really love it. Um, from 800 BC onwards, textiles in Central Europe get more and more decorations. Here, Hallstatt. The interesting thing is now, and what you really can clearly see, that prehistoric textiles in Europe, in Central Europe, are usually not decorated with motifs in a kind known from pottery or bronze artifacts. For, for example, we don't have curved lines, we don't have birds or horses or whatever. It's a different design principle. The reason may be that the way the textiles are made with warp and weft, it's a very strict underlying geometric system. And this system has been clearly used and there was, so to say, no way out for uh, textile production in Europe. It is not only the warp-weighted loom that was used for textile production, but also smaller looms. Here you see the band weaving implements and you see also the, the original textiles and also the, the um, implements that has been found archaeologically. And you know how patterning with such a thing functions. You just fill in different warp threads of different colors and then some pattern will, will be created. It can be chessboard-like uh, or it can be stripey, whatever you want to do. And you can really create in a very nice way. The other thing is tablet weaving. Tablets. You might be familiar with that. The tablets are threaded with different um, uh, colored threads. And then uh, however you turn it backwards, forwards, you can create different patterns. Temperate, tablet weaving is really a very nice possibility in Central Europe um, in, this, um, in the first millennium BC to create patterns. And I'll show you now some examples for tablet weaving. Here, Hallstatt, here, Hochdorf, for example. It's very decorative and very interesting designs that can be made just with turning the tablets. And those bands usually have been used as belts or as trimmings for garments or things like that. Usually they have been woven separately as, as a tablet woven piece and then soon on things Sometimes they have also been woven together, for example, hanging on the side of a wall weighted loom. That is really a very complicated technique. And here you see a reconstruction of a, a spin patterned weave from Hochdorf with tablet woven border that was woven together in one go, so to say. And this is really, so to say, uh, yeah, high textile art and this is about 2500 before christ that means uh, it's more or less contemporary with ancient greece but we are quite sure because in ancient greece so far no tablet weaving has been found and so we think that this is a central european technique and in greece they used other techniques like tapestry to make complicated patterns that means we have in Central Europe a, a different textile culture in comparison with the Mediterranean, with Greece, with Persia, and with Egypt. Here we have the tapestry, no tablet weaving. We also have some shadow or spin patterns. I hope you see that. Uh, spin patterns. Um, are made with alternating groups of S and Z spun yarn threaded in while um, putting up the bob or weft. Um, and it's a very intricate pattern because you can just see it um, when you move the textile in the light and you see those stripes. 
That means that is a type of patterning that is not visible from far away. You must be quite near to see it. And this is also quite interesting because there is a lot of thought in it. There is a lot of, yeah, um, it's, it, it's really hard work to do this and you can hardly see it. That means why the hell did people did it? That means there was a, um, a feeling for high quality textiles that should not be only visible by, from far away. That should be also recognized and seen and felt when you come near. It's, it's the same like if you, for example, look at very high quality men's suits. You see the quality, but you have to know the quality. Otherwise you would not recognize it. And this is the same principle. And we have also this principle in, so to say, primitive Europe before the Romans came. So glitter and glamour, we also have things like that. The sparkle or shininess of an object can be an important aspect of attracting and holding visual attention. The effect of glitter, and especially of gold, dazzles the viewer who sees them in bright light. And even metal elements, were used for the embellishment of textiles in Central European history. And so the gold that was woven into textiles formed a very nice contrast with the textiles itself. Here you see, this is from Hungary and from Austria. And you see clearly that those golden stripes have been woven in some textiles. They appear in the Late Bronze Age, you see here the timeline, 1100 BC, in the today's uh, region of Austria and Hungary. The same phenomenon is known from the Eastern Mediterranean and Near East. For example, Homer in his Iliad, he mentions 100 golden tassels on Athena's garment, for example. Maybe this is some similar to the Fösendorf find here because I think that these golden stripes also have been attached on some fringes. They look like that. <clears throat> In Iron Age, that means slightly later, 600 BC, we also have metal elements together with textiles. Stripes of gold, and metal spirals move in. Here, for example, examples from Hu Michele, you see here how it was woven in, and Waldalgesheim, Bruno Sidenitze. This is all the first millennium BC. What we also have is gold and bronze buttons attached to garments. And this is really a very common phenomenon in Central Europe in the first millennium BC. We often find embellished garments and um, they were um, originally soon on textile or leather items. For example, here, a rich burial from Mitterkirchen. Here you see a more modern example. This is the Catholic priest. Textiles with gold threads are important luxurious goods in the medieval and early modern times as well and even today. And for example, they are used in the Catholic Church to show the power of the church. Here you see, this is a grave find. Here we don't have gold, we have uh, copper, uh, uh, copper embellishment. You see, this, it's the same style. This is a vestment about 1700 AD from Hollenburg. This is a burial. And here you show uh, a modern example on how such a priest looks like. Here you see some uh, SEM pictures from the same. This is um, uh, silk with gold and, and copper. Copper and gold spun around a silk core and used uh, for um, um, embellishing the priest's garment. Here you see this example.
But now for prehistoric textiles again. What is luxury? What is prestige? And how can we define prestige, uh, um, um, high status textiles for prehistory? If you think about this theoretical background, usually archaeology fo focuses on bronze objects when we discuss about prestige goods. But after all I presented so far, I really think that textile creativity can reach visual complexity as we know that from other artifacts. Especially gold. If we use gold in Bronze Age here, 1000 BC, together with textiles, this really is a choice of, for showing status and representation. And also the use of uh, imported dye stuff, for example, um, insect dyes. Insect dyes come from far away. For example, here we have Hallstatt, a map of, also, uh, a map of um, uh, Europe. Here is Italy. Here is the region I am talking about. And insect dyes come from the Mediterranean, for example, and also from this. But usually the dyes that we have come from this area. That means they have been imported for hundreds of, of um, kilometers, I don't know how it's in your measurement system, um, to get this dye stuff. And this is also the, um, the, the question, who is allowed to have this? Because usually we find those textiles in very rich grapes, but sometimes even in the salt mine. And so we also think about how can we how can we uh, say about uh, luxurious goods? For example, if you look on grave goods from Hallstatt periods, and then if you look at textiles, and we see the same prestigious patterns, because usually the, the ceramics, the pottery you find in the settlement that have been used for cooking and for the normal stuff is not painted and is not decorated. These things you find in the graves. And so if you find the textiles, with the same motives, we can also say that this must be very high-ranked things in those societies. Like also here in the Os burial with this prestigious sword, and this sword was wrapped in multiple layers of textiles. That means even in the graves, you have a, a massive use of textiles uh, to, to show off power and wealth. Um, you might know this, uh, we did in, in Europe, um, there is a lot of experimental archaeology working with uh, wall-painted looms that have been in use in, um, <coughs> in prehistoric Europe and they reconstruct um, um, textiles showing how long does it take, you know such figures with a wall-painted loom. This was a reconstruction by Anna Norgard in Denmark. And so I think that for prehistoric societies, it was as much time consuming to make a, a large textile than to make a, a fancy piece of jewelry. And even the, the material, the raw material, might have been on the same cost if, we, uh, if they had to pay for imported dye stuffs like insect dyes. Now some words about the function of textiles in prehistoric societies, what do we know? Um, usually we think that prehistoric textiles in Europe are uh, made for, um, for garments, but we have a lot of different other uses um, that we have uh, by um, archaeological experience. For example, garments, of course, what do we know? Um, we have some garments, for example, in the box in uh, northern, um, um, in, in the northern zone. But we also have, as I explained before, if we can deduce from very small pieces that we find attached to the to the um, uh, to the dress fittings, then we also can deduce the garments. The 
This would be examples for garments that we find in box in Northern Europe. You see here the date. This is also yeah, the first, the third to uh, first centuries before Christ. They are very um, uh, famous, the Huldremose and Torsberg finds. From the salt mine in Hallstatt, we find only fragments of garments, that's a pity, but this was exactly a trimming of some uh, sleeve or whatever. And there is another interesting thing that we can think about garments, uh, because it's the human body laws. Pediculus Romanus Corporis, because it tells a lot about the people and about uh, how, how was it, for example, this washing of garments. This is textiles from Hallstatt, and we found in the seams, we found some, some of those body lies. And so we know that people have been affected by body lies, and so we know that the hygienic uh, conditions were not too, too good in those days. Another thing is, uh, if you like, um, um, body lies very much. For example, if I have engraved finds, if I have body lies in there, because uh, we usually think um, on grave finds, is this a specific made garment as a funeral uh, dressing, for example, or if it was an everyday garment that has been put on the dead body. But if you find body laws, lies on the textile, then we know exactly that this textile was also worn by um, a, a person alive and it was not just specific made for the funeral. This is quite interesting for us. Yeah, for the funeral purpose, we know that shrouds have been used. We know that objects have been covered and wrapped or sometimes even textiles have been given to the dead as a, a funerary gift, so to say. Here you see some wrappings we found in the graves, for example, from this cupboard, this cupboard uh, of a, of a, um, of a um, uh, sword was completely wrapped into textiles. We know also that textiles have been used as um, howling bags, for example, in the salt mine. This is also what we find. We know that there have been mattresses and pillows and, and wall hangings and floor coverings, whatever. And um, oh, for resource management and recycling, we also have some evidence because we find in the salt mine sometimes textiles that have been torn into stripes and then knotted. That means they have been used as makeshift binding material. And we have a lot of different kinds of hints for recycling. For example, if you look at this wonderful textile here, and it was wrapped around a broken tool, that means this was really not the primary use of the textile. It was a second use, um, recycling. And we have also quite nice marks of repair. You see here a patched one. And it was really patched quite carefully. Uh, uh, the, the textile selecting for, uh, selected for patching was carefully selected that it fits in color, in the leaf type, that it really matches. And sometimes we have textiles that are completely reworked. For example, this here is a, a textile. It was taken, it was folded three or four times, and then it was stitched together quite roughly. We have here a primary scene that we know that this was a garment in its first life, so to say, but later it was reworked into something very different. And the very different is some handling tool like this here. And this was used in the salt mine uh, for handling ropes to protect the hand while you are um, dealing with ropes. Yeah, for this lecture with focus on material culture and on some insights about archaeological textile material that we have in, so to say, good old Europe, um, I talked about functions, the aesthetics and technology of textiles, and I tried to 
to, 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 to give you a small uh, picture about what do we have and how nice it is. And here I prepared something nice for you, especially this is a mood board. Uh, I did for you about um, Bronze Age textiles. Here you see Bronze Age textiles, you see the archaeological evidence and all of these other mood things, the color patterns, and then the uh, recreations of uh, garments from the Bronze Age. And the same I did for Hallstatt period. You've seen a lot of those things before, the textiles, even the, the, um, the original artifacts. This is this jewelry here. This is a person depicted as spinning. This is the, a vessel from Chopin, it's um, uh, first millennium BC. And here are some reconstructions of mine. Yeah, then with these two mood boards, I, I hope you enjoyed them. I want to say thank you for your attention and uh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Karina. Um, uh, uh, can you unshare your screen so we can see people again? Sorry, um, no, no, sorry. Uh. So do people have questions? I have one. <laughs> I'll start. Um, the Hallstatt salt mine textiles, uh, obviously some of them from you talked about repurposing were, were used in the mine, but what, what are those textiles? What are they, you know, are they workers clothes? Are they scraps? What Oops, wait a minute, you're muted. Karina, you need to unmute yourself. Okay. Yeah. Um, on the one hand, of course, they are the workers' clothes, but we are quite sure because we have a lot of recycled textiles in there. And we think that a lot of the textiles, especially the, the nice patterned ones, um, have been brought in into the mine as recycling material, just to have some material to clean the tools, to clean the face, to, to have some yeah, soft material, just maybe to use as toilet paper, whatever, because whatever you need in the salt mine. Uh, we know that the society in Hallstatt, about 800 BC, was very, very rich. And we also find some textiles attached to metal artifacts in the graves. And we see that those textiles in the graves are very high quality, like the highest qualities of the textiles we find in the salt mine. We also find coarser ones in the salt mine. And so we think that the nice textiles from the salt mine, the patterned ones, are not the, the garments of the workers, but uh, so to say, recycling material. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but worn uh, over days, so to say, in normal life for festivity garments and so on. Other questions? There may be some in the chat. Let me know. There was a question about Sprang. No, we don't have Sprang in Central Europe. Uh, before before the Romans. I don't know why. In Denmark, they have sprung, we don't have it. I found thousands of textiles uh, from Bronze Age to Iron Age, that means in the two millennia BC, but not any single sprung piece. I'm sorry. <laughs> and we don't have knitting. <laughs> there is no knitted is item. Yeah, no knitting. No sprung. Okay, so somebody asked um, to study the micro strata, strata, 
strategy stratigraphy is that a, are you able to bring the matrix the textiles are in back to the lab or must you work it, on it in situ to preserve the context and also did you start with a background in dress history or did your curiosity lead you to learn this so you could recreate these garments and her stuff. Okay. <laughs> um, the microstratigraphy is documented by archaeologists. I mean, if when the archaeologists are excavating a grave, we of course have to document everything, okay? How a thing is in the grave, lying on the body, and so on. Everything, photos are made, and so on. If the excavator sees, for example, here, here, yeah, metal, and so on. If the excavator sees that there around the metal is a lot of stuff, then he would take a block out, he would lift it as a block and bring it to my lab. And then I can, can study the microstratigraphy. Uh, but sometimes I just get the item with some attached textiles and with pictures from how it was in the grave. And this also helps me to understand how the, the body and the object and the textile, how they are related to each other. And, and tell us, I, I guess I should have done this in the intro, but tell us about your background. I mean, how did you get into this? And, and I, I, I'm, I'm, archae I'm archaeologist, but I also had handcrafts in school. I was, um, I was uh, taught uh, spinning and weaving at the university because at the University of Vienna, we have special courses in experimental archaeology. That means all of us, I mean, who likes, learns how to spin, how to weave, how to make pottery, how to do bronze smithing, whatever. We learn that in university, it's a very specific course because this helps us to understand the artifacts. If you have never made a pot, you cannot understand the archaeological evidence. Yeah. And uh, there's a question from uh, Joe Duke. Uh, do you use x-ray analysis and do you work with Michelle Smith at Brown University? Um, um, I use a lot of uh, uh, analytical tools. I usually work with the Center of Textile Research in Copenhagen and uh, with, for example, Margarita Kleber, who was based in Cambridge. Um, yeah, I'm open yeah. to work with everyone who wants yeah. to work with me. <laughs> and we have all of those analytical facilities in my museum. I also work with the British Museum, for example. And we have all of those things. We have micro CT, we have scanning devices, uh, scanning electron microscopes. We have everything in, in our museum. And yeah, because usually if I'm working with an archeological artifact, it's not so easy to just to travel around with that artifact to bring it <laughs> to Great Britain for any analysis. Usually we do it in the state where we are because we are not, it's, um, in Europe, we have uh, very protective measures for cultural heritage. And so we are usually not allowed to travel around with cultural re relics. We also need complicated permissions and we want to avoid it. <laughs> and so, we, so we are just doing it ourselves. So uh, this question regarding salt mines, were people buried there or are the materials the results of accidents or else? materials left behind. Um, so you might talk a little bit about the Iran find. Uh, the Iran find? Oh, oh, no, 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 no. Uh, we do it the different the way. Hall, yeah, talk we'll do that, but, the but I was just going to say, Hall, Hallstatt, the people are not buried there, but in Iran they were because there was a collapse, right? Uh, in Hallstatt, also some that people in the salt mine that died in the mine have been found, but they have been found 300 years ago, and so they were thrown away. Oh. In Iran, the salt mummies the, in the collapsed mine have been found about 12 years ago, and so, yeah, 
they survived, <laughs> so to say, and uh, um, they are researched now by an international research group. But mm -hmm. if you want, I really can have another talk where I can talk about the Iranian salt farm is yeah. about well. textile technology in ancient Persia. <laughs> you can do that. <laughs> uh, somebody else have. Uh, uh, I've, I've seen a question about how do we stop, uh, how we prevent the, the fines from degrading when they come out of the mine. Okay, the, the important thing is with the salt mine fines is that we just have to wash the salt out because the, the, um, the preservation in the salt mine is because everything is penetrated by salt and so um, um, salt preserved everything because uh, the bacteria cannot work and so on. But now we have to wash the salt out because otherwise the salt would harm the textile. And um, if it's washed out and dry, it's completely stable. We don't have to climatize it. We just put it somewhere and in a, yeah, it's just there, dry condition and in the museum, we keep it. Uh, Karen Hazelcorn had a question. Karen, do you want to pop? Okay, I don't know where she is. I'll, I'll there ask. There was a question her. about what is my most exciting textile find. Oh, of course, the Iranian salt mines. Uh, but no, not even. All of them are exciting. I mean, I even love the small, tiny, ugly textiles with the body lines on it because they are really great. Because there are a lot of, you know, it's about the academic question that you are talking about. <clears throat> uh, a textile, even if it's degraded and has a body loss, it tells me a lot of in, in, important and interesting things. And uh, a lot of uh, colorful textile tells me other stories. And oh, I love them all. Yeah. Yes. For the tablet woven bands, what was the most common width? Um, we have some uh, tablet woven bands from Hallstatt, and there is a new one that uh, sh uh, was show, um, was uh, came out uh, recently. My, my colleague gave me this photo yesterday. Here, it's a new one, unpublished completely. <laughs> it's really he found it. Uh, yeah. Just, just recently, and uh, the next thing I will do with that is to, to reconstruct the weaving technique, and I um, like to reweave it. This is always a challenging task because on those textiles, because you cannot handle them with like like modern textiles. Modern textiles, you would yeah um, handle it a bit or uh, pull around the threads to understand how it was made. But this is the thing you are not allowed to do with archaeological textiles. You can just look at them and yeah. And so uh, they are sometimes quite difficult to reconstruct because sometimes you cannot even turn them around to see the backside. And so, uh, yeah, uh, working and reconstructing archaeological textiles sometimes is really a, a hard task. But it's so challenging and so nice. Um, and there was there were a couple of questions about different fibers, like what fibers are used when and in different regions. Oh. Uh, okay, in Central Europe, it starts in the um, Stone Age, as it means between six thousand and two thousand BC. The most uh, um, the most common fiber is flax, linen, and then um, sheep wool gets turns to be the most common one. Sheep wool, sometimes even goat for Central Europe. And sometimes we also have horse hair. And the horse hair, we usually have just the, the, the long fibers from the mane of the hair, you know, from the, yeah. Uh, also this, this textile here, I figured out his horse hair used as weft to make it stable. You know, because if you weave a band and and you, you don't have a stiff material in it, it, it rolls. 
down. But if you have a stiff weft, then uh, it, it gets more stability and strength. And we figured out that in high shed period, horse hair was quite, uh, was sometimes used as weft for bands to make them more stable. It's quite interesting. And then sometimes also they had fancy things like badger hair or hemp or nettle in prehistoric Europe. Um, cotton comes with the Romans to Europe. Also, uh, sea silk comes with the Romans. Yeah, can you better off Yes. Passed. Awesome. Um, yes. yes. Anna, we, we don't have. Hmm, what? Oh, that's good. Yeah, that that is the most important right. ones. What so, we have for prehistoric Europe. So someone asks, uh, no knitting or spraying, but what about nail binding? Not in Central Europe. I'm okay. so sorry. <laughs> And someone asked, "What was the what was?" I, the I tried to find it. But yeah, <laughs> not successful. Before. It could, it could have just rotted away. What was the set most commonly used for every uh, for different things? Like how um, the set is the how how many um, how many ends per inch or inches per centimeter? Uh, I cannot. I can, uh, I can just say it in centimeters. Yeah. For prehistoric uh, for Hallstatt, okay, in Rose Age, that means in the second millennium BC, the set was coarser. That means it's about um, six to 10 ends per centimeter. Okay, centimeter, I'm sorry. That's okay. But in the Hallstatt period, it gets much more finer. It grows up to 40 ends per centimeter. Wow. <laughs> Centimeter yeah. is there's two and a half centimeters. Uh, it, it, it's, yeah. like, it's like it's like it's yeah. like a finger, yeah. forty ends. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that Especially would be that would be about a hundred per inch. Yeah, 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 yeah. But this is the maximum. The the normal is fifteen to twenty per centimeter per finger, so to say. Fifteen to twenty. So but in was... Bronze Age, it's five to six. The normal. <laughs> <laughs> that means we have an increase of of quality and and uh, in the uh, you, you see this this boom time of of right. creativity and are the threads spun more finely in other words is it just the weaving or is it also the spin of course this this really goes hand in hand you have in bronze age you have um, I didn't show the graph, but I, I have published, uh, published it several times. Uh, just a minute. Yeah. I, I try to find it uh, and show you. It's, it's easier to show. Just a minute. Mm. Oh, take your time. Because it goes hand in hand. Uh, if, if we have uh, finer yarn. Um, so, yes. You see here? See here. Here, the, the, the thick ones that are about one to two millimeters and the very thin is 0 0.2 millimeters. And in Bronze Age, we have more the thick ones, but also some thin. And in Heistad period, we have more the thin ones. You see? Okay? Yeah. And this is also in relation to the textile tools, because the smaller the spindle was, the, the thinner the yarn you can spin, of course. Okay, uh, there was a question about, I've lost it now, <laughs> was about the uh, comparisons to the Wari culture in Peru, where, which is, of course, there's lots of archeological textiles in Peru. And, oh, yeah. 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 And they oh, I, I admire this stuff. It's so wonderful. But they have completely different techniques. We don't have those tapestry types and, and all of their wonderful textiles and textile patterns and structures. Oh, I don't have this 
Yeah. But um, I, I read a question uh, if, if all of this has to do with uh, the mobility of people. Um, in Central Europe, in, in those um, um, time periods I was talking about, people are settled and we have a, a strict social hierarchy. We have uh, poor people, we have some, so to say, princes or elite persons on the top of the hierarchy. And we also see that in the burials. We have a few burials with very rich people, the mass of the people, um, not, not rich, but we don't have written reports for that time so that we know, we don't know that um, if those are slaves or not. Um, this is something that we cannot know for prehistoric societies because we don't have written records. And even the, the ancient Greek people did not tell anything about slavery, for example, in north of the Alps. They told a lot about the, the people north of the Alps, usually that they are barbarians, <laughs> but, but not. But yeah. So, uh, yeah, this, so this is the question about the Wari. Researchers have also established connections between status and culture and Wari culture that's in Peru and whether you had, ah, looked, okay. at that, whether, uh, whether you had looked at any of those sorts of comparisons. Uh, oh, uh, do you mostly find the yarn is single or is it plied? Ah, uh, that's, that's a very fun question. Um, in Bronze Age, we have, in Stone Age and Bronze Age, we have more or less plied yarn. And um, in Heistad period, we have, in one part of Europe, Sing Oops, wait a minute. Sorry, I, I did something and I accidentally muted you. I was, I'm just trying to make it so that people can unmute themselves, but <laughs> okay. All right, I think, I think you can unmute yourself. Yeah, okay. sorry, sorry about so, that. Um, yeah, in uh, the Hashtag textiles usually are single yarn in Bob and Weft. That means it's really interesting because if you have single yarn and this is 0 0.2 millimeter strong, that means less than this, you see, uh, single yarns, 40 ends per centimeter. I mean, it's really, and, and, and woven on a warp baited loom. This is really hard to believe that it, it could function but it functioned because we have the textiles. And so I really admire Hashtag period textile art because it, it really shows high developed handcraft and abilities and skills of the people. And, and I really love this. And there's no evidence of other types of looms. So we know that it must have been a warp weighted loom. <laughs> the problem is that we don't, would not see it because Every loom that just is made of two sticks, you would never find. Yeah. Well. Okay, we're we're reaching the end of our allotted time. Uh, maybe one or two more questions. If anybody has, if anybody wants to jump in, you should be able to actually be heard now. I really want to know if if you found any similarities, if you found textiles like this in Poland as well, because I'm curious to know if it's an economic thing that some of these these garments were so beautifully and intricately intricately woven, and how that relates to whatever you might have seen coming out of Poland, which was right next door, but a very different culture. Um. In Poland, we don't have a lot of textile evidence, but what when when we have some engraves, for example, because usually uh, in Poland we don't have a salt mine that is from the same period, for example, Hallstatt period, um, and from the graves we see quite similar qualities and similar uh, textile structures. We see rabbits, we see twirls, we see 
this more or less same range of um, um, uh, th thread counts and, and thread diameters. It means it's, it's quite similar. But Thank we you. see differences from the Central European and the take Poland visitors and the Mediterranean or Greece or other things. This is a complete different picture in the timeline of 800 to 400 BC. Great. Anyone else? All right, thank you very much. Just, I'm also adding this to the, uh, the, the chat. Um, we're, I will make a video and uh, it will be posted on our website and the way you can find it, uh, there is a, there's a meeting archives for members, but the way you can find this is just to find this event. So go in the calendar and look on today's date and click on it and uh, the video will be there in, a, in in a couple of days. It depends on <laughs> when I get it done. I usually start working on it pretty fast, but it takes me forever to upload them. I actually have to go to Starbucks and sit in their parking lot because they have better Wi-Fi than I do <laughs> <laughs> for uploads. Anyway, and um, oh, and there is uh, someone uh, writing in German. Wow. Oh, oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, it was a pleasure. Uh, and just reminding everybody, we will be having this weave along. Uh, that's for members and, and it's free with Chantal. So look on that if you, you or your family want to make a Halloween doll with the Zoom, the little Zoom loom. And on September 26th, we have Anatomy of a Tapestry with Jean Pierre and Yadi La Rochette. Thanks very much, Karina. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Goodbye from Vienna. Have a good evening. Bye. <laughs> Thank your family for sharing you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> bye bye.